I guess you got a lot of great memories of your years with Bill Monroe, don't you? Well, I only worked with him about uh, one year in uh, 1949. I came here to operate work with him. But it was a very educational and pleasant year, and I enjoyed it very much. Of course, we worked all through the years up to his death. Uh, to when he became incapacitated, he couldn't work any longer. But with a lot of the festivals, so we saw a lot of each other on the bluegrass festivals. And toward the end of the evening, we'd usually have a little gang bang, so to speak, and everybody would sing, you know. So, but uh, I enjoyed his camaraderie. He was a pioneer in his own way, I'll tell you that. Do you consider yourself country or bluegrass? Well, I just do not have any tag put on it. I do some of both. But, uh, well, you do it well. Just say, here it is. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else here ever work with Bill Monroe? I mean, other yeah, than at the Opry? You know, well, you resist two. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Turn the mic around there, Mike. Let him yeah. know. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm going to tell you, it's funny what about Bill. Now, this, this is really the truth. I was at one of the rope meetings, and uh, Bill was sitting at the table with us, and uh, somebody brought up a, a promoter's name down in Florida, and Bill said, I don't like that man. <laughs> said, I never did like that man. Say, he he done something to me one time, said, I don't remember what it was, but I never did forgive him. I described him completely. We all lived in a trailer park over on Dickerson Road. Rainbow. A long time ago. Rainbow. Rainbow. <laughs> no, it was uh, Dickerson. Yeah, Rainbow. Dickerson that Rainbow. Rainbow. That's right. Go wow. on Dickerson Road and Bill had horses back then. He invited me to ride with him one day and I rode, of course I was drinking back them days, <laughs> and, and we rode all day long, never stopped riding, and he never said a word all the way till we get back to the trailer camp. He got off and said, had a good time, boy. <laughs> he was a man of few words, Jimmy. Uh, I need to grow a mic. Y'all on the mic. <laughs> Thank you. I had the pleasure uh, the year after I moved from Louisiana here to the Grand Ole Opry of doing a tent tour all through Mississippi until the tent uh, tornado came and blew the tent away. But anyhow, we had a great, it was a great experience to me because I'd been working those knife and gun clubs in Louisiana and, uh, <laughs> and a few shows. And uh, yeah, Skull Arches. And, and then we did this tent show. And uh, the Everly's. Uh, <laughs> were on the tour, and on the tour, the Everly's had Bye Bye Love to be released, and I had a fallen star to come out. And at the time, Jim Reeves' Four Walls came out, and I'll never forget those times, because we had a, it was a great experience working with Bill. Later, Bill recorded two of my songs. But we traveled in this uh, limo, and I rode, and Rufus and I rode with uh, Bill, and we had the back seat with the four Pekingese dogs. Two, two picking these up. And you talk about dangerous, too. You have to be careful where you, you sit down because then dolls <laughs> take a chunk out of you. It's a great experience. They eat you alive. Yeah, they yeah. I got bit several times. <clears throat> we handed them uh, crawfish every once in a while to keep them tamed. <laughs> but we got by God. It was a great experience. Uh, you know, right after coming to the Grand Ole Opry to tour with Bill Monroe and to know what it was like in the and the tent shows and everything. And as I said, he recorded two of my songs later. So I've got great memories of Bill Monroe, and most of us do. Uh, Bill, I, I spent a little time around Miss Monroe. He looked like my father, and I told him that first time I ever met him. He must be a good-looking man. Yeah, he's, yes, sir. He <laughs> but Flatt and Scruggs, who worked with him when Mac, just before or after Mac worked with him, I guess everybody in the bluegrass business has one time worked with Bill. Oh, yeah. Paul Warren, for instance. And, and anyway... Flatten Scruggs and Bill with the group were going up someplace in Kentucky to play. And Bill said, pull up this next house up here on the right and stop over there. Stop and be there a minute. So they stopped and, and Bill got out and he walked across a, a bridge, walking bridge, across to this little house and he knocked on the door. And this big tall fella came out and they went to Fist City right there on the porch. <laughs> just knocking each other around. Then all of a sudden he turned around and came got back in the car and they went on. It was his brother, Charlie. <laughs> Something would bother him on his mind, you know, and he, he'd get all upset about that. But talking about Flatten Scrubs, and one more, I asked Earl one time, and you know how sweet Earl is, just very quiet, 
I said, Earl, in all seriousness, I said, Earl, which hand is, is the most important when you're playing the banjo? He thought a minute, he said, well, you pretty much have to have both of them. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, do you know uh, how many bluegrass players it takes to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> how many, Joe? It takes seven. One to screw it in and six to say Earl Scruggs didn't do it that way. <laughs> Bill, I worked a couple times with uh, Bill when Bessie was there, and those little Pekingese dogs would eat you alive. As long as you was looking at them, they was okay, but you turn around to leave the room, and man, they would attack you. And I told Bessie, I said, Bessie, the next time one of them boogers gets me, it's, they're, they're gonna pick them up off the wall. Cause they were mean. And speaking of Bill, he did travel with this horse. One time they left Nashville, and he had the horse in the trailer. And they was driving about 40, 50 miles down, and they heard this cloppity clop, and they couldn't figure out what it was. Well, the bottom had come out of the trailer, and that horse was running, and he run for 40 miles trying to keep up with it. <laughs> Bill Monroe, when I had open heart surgery, Bill Monroe was there. He came and he uh, stayed with me until they took me down the hall, and then he walked as far as they let him go. Finally, they said, Mr. Monroe, you can't go any further. And he, now I don't remember this because I was out, but they told me about it. He took my hand and he opened it up and he put a quarter in there. <laughs> yeah. And he closed my hand up and he said, now you bring that back to me, boy. <laughs> and then he stayed there and he took my kids to lunch. And my daughter told me, he said, he didn't say nothing. He just took us to lunch and sat there with us the whole time. Yeah. And he would not leave that hospital till he knew I was all right. Well, I was just gonna say, and that shows how he was, but what I'm amazed at is we listen to these stories and share these stories, and just to see God's grace and goodness just protecting everybody yeah. and bringing everybody on these journeys. And Bill sang for my 50th birthday and my 60th birthday. But on my 50th, I asked him, and the girls know this because we shared this recently mm -hmm. when we did a show together, but uh, he had named a little horse Skeeter. And on my 50th birthday, uh, I, asked, I invited him to the church that I was attending, which also is the church Jeannie C. was going through that we talked about. And uh, he came, and he actually really committed his life uh, back to Christ. And he had just been such a, uh, a Christian that I think it was so great. And, um, and when he left, and when I went to his um, uh, funeral at the uh, Opry House, and then also at, the, at Rosine, I slipped a quarter in his pocket because they did take the quarters out of the casket, I think, mm -hmm. to give the children. But I left one in his pocket, John. But I think that's what's so amazing, just to hear all these stories and, and just to see how God has been so protective and so gracious to everybody that all these journeys, and I just have to throw that in right now. I mean, they may pitch it out, but I gotta throw it in there right now. <laughs> we were sitting in church one day, sitting in church, and Bill always sat right behind me. And he leaned up, he said, have you got chains for a hundred? I said, no, sir, I sure don't. He got up and went up to the altar. And when they brought the plates up there, he put the hundred dollar bill in and took change out. <laughs> you know, the preacher told me later, he said, he said, that really touched me. He said, there's a lot of people that would have that hundred dollar bill and say, well, I can't put a hundred hundred dollar bill in there and I can't get changed, so I just won't put anything in. But he went up and I'll he never got changed. <laughs> Bill, Bill, I got, I got one more thing about Bill Monroe. I got to tell this. A guy sent me a song. This is true. And it was called, I don't want a cabin in the valley. I just want a shack up in the hills. <laughs> I took it to Acuff and I said, Ake, got a hit song for you. And I told him the title. Well, Acuff thought it was the funniest thing he ever heard. <laughs> so I went next door and told Bill Monroe. I said, Mun, got a hit song. Mm -hmm. I don't want a cabin in the valley. I just want a shack in the hills. He said, you making fun of people born and raised in cabins? I said, no, no, no. He said, I was born and raised in cabins. You making fun of people living in cabins? I said, no, Bill, it's a joke. All of his guys, all of his guys left, and he quit speaking to me. If Bill said, Heidi, Heidi, he really liked you. He quit speaking to me for months, but he went to the hospital when he had heart surgery, and I waited till he got out of intensive care, and I sent him a little vine, and I said, I don't care if you are mad at me, you old poot. I still love you. 